Okay, welcome back. Uh, our next speaker is uh, um, Doc, Doc, Doc Arwin. So for us, the complexity really means a lot. So now I have a um, daughter. She's about uh, nine years, three months. You know, that's how, I, how the way I count her age. But the interesting thing is in the elementary school or even in the secondary school, we learn quite diverse of discipline, like including history, biology, physics, chemistry, mathematics, and also literature. But the issue is when we enter the college, we become sort of get a very specialized um, education. But now this um, complexity program is sort of bring us back to the, to the new stage of, <coughs> of childhood. And one um, very um, typical example is, uh, I would say, is a dog, because uh, he's a, uh, you can so call the, the paleobiologist, or also he's very close to the naturalist. So he has a very broad interest. So as we all know, the, the remarkable film called the Jurassic Park, directed by Steve uh, Spielberg in mid 90s. So that's about, talk about the, the the species of dinosaurs. But now for the dog, he even want to understand more or want to explore more in the geologic time scale to go beyond Jurassic Park, a uh, Jurassic stage, go to the Permian stage, try to understand the massive ex extinction of the, you know, the species in that period of time. But arguably, uh, as like one uh, people review, like a uh, dog has a view, maybe we are entering a new stage which we are like a, has sort of hidden danger, but that we have to be aware of. So I think that's a time for a dog to share his uh, view. Here, dog please. Thank you, and it's a, a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Jan and uh, the Complexity Group for the invitation to, to come to Singapore. Um, for an evolutionary biologist, um, this part of the world is sort of the second um, center of evolutionary thought. Um, of course, because Alfred Russell Wallace um, also came up with the idea of natural selection um, not that far from here. Um, I want to take a, a look today at um, innovation in a very broad sense, uh, in the sense uh, meant by this, this meeting. Um, and I want to look at uh, a question about whether or not the factors that drive in innovation in biological, cultural, and technological systems are similar. There's obviously similarities at a very broad level in the sense that variation, inheritance, selection, and drift occur in all of these um, systems. Um, there are some people who call this approach to looking at these things universal Darwinism, um, although that, that's also a term that's loaded with a lot of of baggage, but in, in essence, what we want to do is understand the processes that drive innovation. Um, with respect to the talks yesterday, this is uh, what I'm really going to be focusing on is not adaptation, but what was termed yesterday radical innovation. Um, is the hope that understanding some of these systems may shed light on the processes underlying others, and ultimately the goal is to build models. Um, of what drives innovation in any of these systems. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about what I'm not going to be talking about, what I really don't mean. Um, many of us, um, when we think of innovation, um, often think of adaptive radiations. This is a slide of um, work done by a whole series of um, scientists, including most recently um, Peter and Rosemary um, uh, grant at uh, Princeton University looking at the species dynamics of the finches in the Galapagos Islands on the other side of the Pacific. In this case, you have the diversification of a whole lot of different uh, bill forms from a single ancestral form that was presumably blown in from Ecuador um, many hundreds of thousands or several million years ago. And on the Galapagos Islands, they've diversified into a variety of different species. And this diversification is often taken as a basic model for evolutionary innovation. And one of the points that I want to make today 
in talking about a very different kind of innovation is that this is merely one type of diversification and, and innovation and shouldn't straightjacket our thinking about the breadth of uh, changes that happen in evolution. Another example of such an adaptive innovation are the Hawaiian silver swords. This is a diverse group of plants on the Hawaiian islands. Um, also in the Pacific, they look a lot like yucca. The silver swords have all been descended from, uh, have all come from one incredibly undistinguished shrub that lives in coastal California. Um, they got to Hawaii and diversified into things that look like yucca, little button plants, shrubs, trees, and a whole host of other things. So this is one indication of the power of morphological change that can happen within adaptive radiations. And these are certainly an important component of evolution. In technological systems, we see similar sorts of things. This is a the, the a presumably adaptive diversification of, of, uh, of nails that serve some function. This is the diversity of crest, crest toothpaste that you can find in your nearest drugstore. Um, it's less clear to me whether there's actually an adaptive function to all these different toothpastes, but there's certainly a purpose to get shelf space and people's money for things they probably don't actually need. What I want to talk about, what I want to focus on most of this morning's talk is an event that began um, a little over 550, 600 million years ago called the Cambrian Explosion. This is a diversity of fossils and reconstructions representing a few of the taxa that first appeared during this explosive radiation of animals. Um, you see some sponges up here, um, some very early echinoderms. This is your, one of your earliest relatives, a cephalochordate named Pacaya, as well as a number of very bizarre and unusual organisms, including the coolest animal that ever evolved in the history of the planet, in my humble opinion, um, which is Opabinia, which I'll talk about a little bit more at the end. That's a, that's a really neat animal, by the way. Um, <laughs> it is. I mean, it's got, well, we could, we'll go back here. So five eyes. This is about three or four inches long. It's got five eyes on stalks on its head. It's got this great proboscis that comes out in the front of it. This is a, the actual fossil from the Smithsonian with a claw on the end of it and these lateral flaps. I mean, it's like something out of the bar scene in the first Star Wars movie before they started going downhill. Um, so what this Cambrian radiation represents is the construction of a design space um, that occurred, as far as we can tell, at least in geological times, relatively rapidly. And what we want to know is how is that design space constructed? What components of reflected the physical environment, which I won't talk about much today. Um, how much of it reflected changes in genes and developmental interactions? And how much of it reflected ecological processes? These are the same questions, as I'll come back to at the end of the talk, in a slightly different vein that we have to think about um, in talking about cultural and technological innovation as well. Um, this is a depiction of the uh, appearance of major groups of organisms during this bit of time. Let me take you through the slide here. Along this axis, we have time from 580 million years ago up to 440 million years ago, um, encompassing two intervals of time known as the Ediacaran down here and the Cambrian, and then a bit of the Ordovician at the top that you can forget about. Um, the main point I want to make here is that in looking at the biggest groups of animals, what are called phyla, as well as the components of them in the Linnaean system classes, most, many of these groups first appear um, at very low levels between about 542 million years ago and 520 million years ago. And then there's a burst of both phyla and classes um, in what's called Cambrian stage three here, and basically by the end of the Cambrian, all the excitement is over. We have all the major groups of animals, including vertebrates. Um, the sole exception um, is a, a group of animals called the bryozoans. Now, how many of you have ever heard of bryozoans? 
Oh, amazing. Well, of course, Murray's heard of them. Murray's and Simon. Okay, so four of you have heard of Bryas Owens. You don't actually need to know much about Bryas Owens, so we can skip past those. Um, the, our, our, uh, our knowledge of this interval of time is greatly aided by the fact that we have some, we have a series of exquisite fossil deposits in many different parts of the world. These fossil deposits preserve many of the soft parts of the anatomy that usually aren't preserved as fossils. These things include up in the Yangtze Gorges in South China, um, fossilized embryos from the Doshanto Formation. We have a series of um, deposits of what are called Ediacaran fossils um, from Kangaroo Island in Australia, the Avalon Peninsula in uh, Newfoundland, the White Sea um, in Russia, the Ediacaran Hills in South Australia, in Namibia, and many other places in the world. That gives us our first view of these animal fossils, and I'll show you some pictures of those in a minute. And then in the Cambrian itself, we have another set of exquisite fossils, and I'll show you a number of things from the Burgess Shale, which is a deposit up in the Western Rockies um, in British Columbia and Canada. This Ediacaran biota that predates the Cambrian explosion itself is composed of a variety of fronds and disks. Here's a, a little frond, it's a, about an inch long, some disks you can see here. Some of these are very small, it's only a couple of millimeters um, across. Um, with the exception of this form up here called Kimbrella, none of these things have appendages. None of them have eyes. None of them have any sign of a gut. They're very simple um, frond or disc-like organisms. The, the evolutionary affinities of most of these things are unclear. This form here from the White Sea in Russia is called Kimbrella. It actually turns out to be a very primitive rel relative of a mollusk. So we have a diverse set of fossils before the Cambrian explosion, but they're very different from what we see after 542 million years ago. This is a shot of the Burgess Shale Quarry up in British Columbia in Canada. It's a shot from about 20 years ago because if we were up there now, this glacier would have retreated even further, sadly. Um, 520 million years ago, this was along the coast of North America in fairly tropical waters. Um, it's a deep sea deposit where material has been brought down from shallower waters. And we have exquisite preservation of material in this, um, in this deposit. This is a slab of trilobites and other forms that we, was collected by Charles Walcott beginning in 1909. You can see a variety of things on here. And I just want to point out that some of these things, for example, the trilobites here, the Olenelids, include impressions of the legs along the side. There's a bit of an antenna coming up off the top, and you can see the same thing over here. If we look at some of the other fossils, this is one of the more recently described forms known as Herdia. Gretchen Daly did, Gwen Daly did her um, PhD thesis on this at Uppsala in 2009. This uh, animal is about 10 inches long. It, the body of the animal is here with a tail, and then it's got a large um, head shield covering the mouth, and then some appendages hanging down below it. This is a very early relative of arthropods. It's related to Animalocarus. Um, this is a top view of an Animalocarid, the tail down here, these lateral flaps to either side, and it's got these two giant appendages. Herdia basically is an Animalocarid with a head shield stuck on the, the front end. Until 2009, this was uh, believed to be three, there, this was in three different parts and only assembled after or during uh, Daly's PhD thesis. This is a large predator. These things in China got up to be about two meters long. Um, trilobites, of course, were quite common. Here's a shea. This is an onocophrin worm, about three inches long. You can see the body of the animal here. This is the head with some um, slight appendages, pairs of appendages with small claws on the end of them, leading people to think that it may have, have crawled up sponges. 
onychophrons or lobopods are very common in the, the uh, Cambrian deposits. This is a, another form um, reconstructed from uh, fossils in China. The body of the animals down here, you can see these spines coming up off it, and the legs are, are mostly buried in the specimen down here. Big bulbous head at, head at one end. This allows us to, do, to make reconstructions like this. Um, you've got this big Antilochus coming in here, Opabinius peeking over the uh, arms of a, uh, a sponge in the corner, Crigum and Chilia, a variety of other things. And the main point is that we get a remarkable diversity of design forms, although really not that many species, within what to a geologist is a very short amount of time. We have a, a group of things down here in the early part of the Cambrian called the small shelly fossils. These are mostly tubes and, um, and plates and things. But then the major forms that I've just been describing all appear very rapidly in some of these exquisite fossil deposits. Now, one of the, the other ways of looking at um, the morphological diversity that we see in the Cambrian is to measure quantitatively what we call disparity. Disparity is a, a way of assessing form rather than simply the number of taxa, phyla, classes, families, things like that. When we ignore taxa and simply look at form, the pattern that we get is that the morphous space defined by arthropods or priapulid worms or many of these other groups is defined very early in their history. So the state space is defined early and then it's filled in. The space doesn't grow through time. This is the claim that Steve Gould made in 1989 in his book, Wonderful Life, and it was later his student, Michael Foote, and several other generations of students at the University of Chicago that turned um, Steve's ruminations in, in the, to science in a quantitative way. And all, a whole host of these groups that I've shown here have now been studied, and all of them indicate this very rapid increase in diversity, only later in uh, disparity, shown here in the dash line, time going this way, disparity goes up rapidly, only later does diversity, the number of taxa, climb as the space is filled in. So that gives us one indication about the, the pattern of innovation at the morphological scale that's happening during the Cambrian radiation. So let me now move um, to ask what's the role of gen genomic and developmental changes in structuring this. Of course, one hypothesis is that what's driving this are changes to the genomic and developmental system. If that's true, then we have an explanation for what's happened. Um, to, to set the steam for this, let me um, briefly take you through a figure from a paper in 2010 by Eric Alms Group from MIT. This is a paper in Nature in which they looked at um, the birth, death, loss, transfer of genes, the sort of thing that we were discussing in uh, John Holland's talk during the discussion a few minutes ago. If you look on the left here, this is a uh, scale through time from the beginning of the oldest evidence for life we have about three and a half uh, billion years ago. Now, the, the data here is from living organisms, so they're projecting back to the original life, um, and there, there are ways of doing that. We're looking through time as we come down here to the present. The Cambrian radiation that I'm talking about is about that dotted line there just past uh, a half a billion years ago. This figure shows um, gene loss on this side, gene gain on this side, and this, the kind of changes you can see in these different colors. So red, primarily concentrated at the base here, um, is the birth of new genes. Green is the, these uh, horizontal gene transfer events. Blue are duplications of genes. And loss is this mustard color, whatever it is. And this is only for redox and electron, electron transport genes. You can see there's a very different pattern of what happens at different points in time. But the, one of the more interesting things happens if you look at this evolutionary tree from the figure. Um, again, three and a half billion years ago is in the center. The Archean up to two and a half billion years ago is um, right in right that sort of donut there. 
and then time is going outwards, and today is around the outside of this. The, the main thing I want to draw your attention to is that within this clay here that includes plants, fungi, and animals, most of the changes, the bulk of them, are gene duplication events. And that's true not only of the genes that were studied by Eric Alm's group, but a, a series of other genes as well. Let me focus in on our closest relatives. Um, the closest animal group to animal, or the closest uh, group to animals is something called coanoflagellates. The genome um, of coanoflagellates, the Montesica genome, has been sequenced by Nicole King at Berkeley and her colleagues. As, and it, we have whole genomes of many other um, things, including the sponge amphimedon, um, a plaque is owned called trichoplax, sea anemone nematostella, and flies or drosophila. And the thing I want to call your attention to here is that although there's great differences in the size of the genome of these different animals, um, and differences in the number of genes, basically once you get to about 18,000 genes, you can build whatever you want. It's not the number of genes that produces morphological complexity. Rather, it's the interactions between those, and one index of that is the number of transcription factors and also microRNAs, which I won't discuss very much, which are in these lower couple of rows. Let me focus on one aspect of these transcription factors. These are the Hox genes. This is a uh, multicolored in situ hybridization of a developing Drosophila embryo. Um, this is the sort of thing that developmental biologists love to do. And this shows in different colors in the developing embryo from the head end around to the tail that different genes have been expressed to produce the different components from the front to the back of the developing embryo. So we have labial um, DFD up at the anterior end and then a series of other genes um, controlling body plan um, or regionalization as we go back down. And this shows a more simple schematic for some sort of generalized uh, insect on the left that we have a series of these genes. And the, the interesting thing about the Hox genes, um, but both in arthropods and across animals, is that in most cases, they're lined up together um, on a chromosome. So we have a chromosome with a series of Hox genes that have arisen through duplication events, and different genes have then specialized control, to control the body plan formation of different parts of the embryo. So this gene in green is controlling the anterior end, and then as the colors get warmer, we're going back to the posterior part of the body. This pattern of diversification of these developmental genes, these are called transcription factors, happens in, a, in much of the body plan formation. So eyes, gut, appendages, other aspects of the body plan are also controlled by the duplication and divergence of these um, uh, transcription factors. By studying these in different organisms, developmental biologists can actually build a tree, which is shown here, of the duplication and the growth of these, this Hox gene component. So what you see here with sponges at the top is an increasing number of these transcription factors. The different classes of gene, the sort of subfamilies, if you will, are shown by the different colors. So the, an the anterior genes are in uh, baby blue here. Those don't undergo much duplication. The next genes undergo a little duplication. But then it's the two posterior classes of genes that um, in bioterian animals are, have undergone many duplication events and control the sort of body plan formation we see in arthropods. So you can do this with a lot of other transcription factors. And in 2001, Sean Carroll, who's uh, at the University of Wisconsin, put together this sort of cartoon of the different genes that might have existed in the last common ancestor of flies and mice. These are all genes that are found in both mice and chicken and us, raised vertebrates, as well as in flies. That means they must have been shared by the last common ancestor of those two groups of animals. 
That la we'll get to when that last common ancestor actually lived, but that includes genes for things called uh, gene PAC6, which controls the photoreceptor, um, distillus, which controls outgrowth, so the body wall, because Sean wasn't willing to say appendages, um, the gut, the nervous system, even the heart with a wonderful gene named Tin Man, um, segmentation, and various body axes. Now, I don't actually believe that this organism ever existed for reasons that we'll get to in a moment, but this shows you that by this sort of comparative developmental approach, one can begin to understand the developmental aspects of organisms that lived a half a billion years or more ago. Let me now move to the question of when these things existed. The, the point of, that I'm going to get to in a moment is that um, the reason I don't think that this, that all these genes were present, but that they weren't doing the functions that Sean has assigned to them in this cartoon, has to do with when this thing existed. And what I'm now going to try and convince you of is that the origin of these major groups of animals and the origin of this developmental toolkit happened 150 million years before the fossils we see in the Cambrian explosion. And the reason for that gap, what we call a macroevolutionary lag, is not because the fossil record is lousy. The fossil record of that interval of time is actually really good. And a lot of us have spent a lot of time walking up and down rocks in China and Africa and North America and other places looking for animal fossils. The animal fossils are not there, not because we can't find them, but because they hadn't evolved yet. And that tells us something important about the structure of this innovation. So this is a molecular clock analysis we published at the end of 2011 in Science. Um, it's a, for those of you that for some reason are interested in the, the guts of um, molecular clock analysis, you can you can look at the paper, but basically a molecular clock allows us to take sequences from living taxa, in this case, seven different housekeeping genes, and 118 living taxa. We sequence the genes, we use a series of algorithms um, combined with calibration points in the fossil record to project back um, to, to determine when these different lineages branched through time. And this is the result that we get. We have taxa along here with fungi represented by beer at the top um, and vertebrates represented by lioness pawing because we didn't have a picture of Murray. Um, <laughs> and this, this ra rather rich data set allows us to infer when these different groups of, of animals split through time. So within the vertebrates, the shallower branches are relatively recent, and then we go back through time. The Cambrian radiation that I've talked about is between the green and the brown line here, and then we go back into to earlier parts of what we call the Proterozoic. So time is going towards the present, and this is today. So if we step through this diagram, the last common ancestor of all living animals looks like it was about 780 to 800 million years ago, long before we see any evidence in the fossil record. The last common ancestor of Cnidarians and Bilaterians, of sea anemones and everything else, is about 700 million years ago. Still, long before anything we see in the fossil record. The last common ancestor of Bilaterians, so flies and mice, the age of that cartoon that um, Sean Carroll uh, drew in 2001, would be 668 million years ago, plus or minus this or that, well before we see any evidence of this level of complexity, 120 million years before we see any evidence of animals of this level of complexity. So there's a long lag between when we think these organisms uh, arose and when, um, by molecular clock analysis, and when we see evidence of them in the fossil record. Now the interesting thing in uh, this analysis is that we, when we look at the crown group, which is the last common ancestor of all the living taxa, that match, matches the Cambrian quite well. The dots on the diagram here show the, last, the age of, of the last common ancestor 
based on the molecular clock analysis alone, not based on fossils except for the calibration points, the last common ancestor for living examples, for example, for example of nematodes, um, and all the last common ancestor of living annelids would be in the Ordovician, last common ancestor of some of the mollusks would be back here in the very latest Ediacaran, about the age of Kimberella, which is what we have in the fossil record. So we see amazing concordance between the molecular clock results for the, what we call the crown group and the fossil record. And that gives us a lot of confidence that this molecular clock analysis is about right. And here you see um, the fossil evidence combined with the, the analysis from the molecular clock. But that leaves us with a problem. What was happening for 200 million years? Particularly if the animals in that time had a fairly sophisticated developmental toolkit, at least since that node. That node there is the last common ancestor of all of these different groups of animals, and by all evidence, had a sophisticated suite of developmental tools. Let me now move into looking at the structure of, of actual gene regulatory networks. Um, this is a horrible diagram to show to all of you before lunch. Um, as John Holland said, you now have, you know, if you lose half your audience with every equation, you lose 90% of it by showing this diagram. Um, it's a really neat diagram, though. Uh, this is the wiring diagram for how to build the cedarchin. This is from Eric Davidson's lab, and it's all available at biotapestry.org, which is one of his lab's websites. Eric is a developmental biologist who works on cedarchins and has been progressively refining the structure of regulatory interactions required by the developing cedarchin embryo. And this mess shows the interaction between various genes, their upstream regulatory sequences, um, and how they affect other genes. And it turns out there's a really interesting structure to it. Let me just help you with a schematic here. You have inputs to part of this gene regulatory network of um, various signals and transcription factors. The, that GRN then affects particular genes. The genes are shown in red here. Um, those then drive other genes, um, and you ultimately wind up driving differentiation genes, which are the, the th sort of things that um, produce eye spots on butterflies and things like that. If we just look at one, the earliest component of the network, and this is the, the beast for which this network has been built, you see some maternal inputs up here. It, various genes are turned on that turn on other genes. Um, a couple of the, the features of these networks is that there are circuits that lock down the, the pattern of expression of different genes, other circuits that express these differentiation genes, and ultimately these genes down at the base are what produce the skeletogenic system of the embryo. But there's a lot of regulation that has to go on to produce that, that downstream component. What's really fascinating, however, is that when you compare, if you look at the structure of this in the detail, it turns out there's a component of this regulatory network here in the middle, um, which is exactly the same between cedarchins and starfish. So this, G, this recursively wired set of interactions at the core of this network right in here has been preserved for 550 million years. If you go in experimentally and knock out any of these genes, you knock out the developing embryo. So producing the, the uh, embryo, producing the, the gut in either a starfish or a um, sea urchin requires these interactions um, in the same pattern. So basically what's happen what happened 550 million years ago is that these genes took over control of forming the gut. And we've, Eric and I have called these a kernel, and they've remained stable for the, the next 
550 million years. This is exactly the sort of technological lock-in or biological lock-in that Brian has described as technological lock-in. Once you get this sort of thing, it's really hard to get rid of it. The only way you can get rid of it is by getting rid of the gut. You have to become so simplified that you no longer form the gut. And there are some things like proganoferin clams that, or worms that, that actually do that. So that locks things into this particular sort of structure. And there are other components of these networks that we've identified that are highly conserved in some cases, highly labile in others, that suggest that there's a real hierarchical structure to these developing networks that has allowed the production of all these different morphologies. Some parts of the morphology, forming appendages or eyes or guts, remain stable for hundreds of millions of years. Other more distal components of the network are more labile and change more readily. But genes aren't enough because this t most of this toolkit was present 150 million years before what we see in the fossil record. So the other part of this system that we have to look at are the ecological interactions. Certainly one of the things that happens in the Cambrian is that all of a sudden we get a whole lot of things that eat other things. There are no predators within that ediacaran biota that I described to you at the beginning, but, but, but as soon as the Cambrian shows up, there are lots of things that are eating other things. That tells us something about the energy flow within these systems, um, but it also tells us quite a bit about the complexity of the ecological networks. We get the same answer, incidentally, not just by looking at the fossil record, but also by comparing it to this molecular clock analysis that I described, because this also shows us, based on molecular data, um, the age of the age of the crown group that includes various predatory groups, some of which are in the base of the Cambrian, others, for example, vertebrates are further up in the Cambrian, although we're fairly sure there are predatory vertebrates um, about 20 million years before that uh, purple dot. So there are a number of predatory groups that are clearly a component of these Cambrian faunas. There's another component to it as well, um, and this is a, a topic that has sort of indirectly come up in the previous parts of this meeting, and this is how do you actually build the ecological networks that these organisms um, are taking advantage of or are, are a part of? One of the things that happens is that if you look at the sediment um, from the, the late Precambrian into the Cambrian, you go from sediments that are planar laminated, they look just like thin layers of a cake with no disturbance to very well mixed um, sediments because of burrowing and other kinds of activities. So even if we had no fossils, sedimentologists would know that something profound had happened simply because the burrowing activity of the organisms changes from, from insignificant to so important that it completely mixes the sediment and that we no longer get these planar laminated sediments. That has a lot of impl ecological implications as well. And let me give you a, a more recent example of this. This is the American oyster, oyster Chrysostria virginicana, and that's in Chesapeake Bay on the right in the eastern United States. Washington, D.C. is up here along the Potomac. This is the mouth of the Chesapeake, um, and it goes up here and into to Pennsylvania. Um, in 1604, I think, when the first British colonists sailed in the mouth of the Chesapeake to set up their misbegotten colonies down here, the Chesapeake, basically everything above nine meters water depth was covered with oysters. Oyster reefs were so common that the British Navy spent a couple of hundred years using them for target practice because they were a threat to navigation. At that time, well, as late as 1870, um, the, 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 all the water in the bay went through the filtration of some oyster in two days. So the entire bay was filtered in two days. By 1979, it took over a year to filter all the water in the bay because there are no more oysters, because they ate them all. Um, I think I'll skip this. 
The, but my, my point is that the, the fil filtering activity of these oysters has an incredible impact on the, on the physical and geochemical nature of the water. And it actually controls the kind of other organisms that can live there. So the, the abundance of this one species controls the ecological state of the ecosystem. If you have oysters in abundance within the Chesapeake, you have fish and mollusks and crabs and all sorts of other things. If you take the oysters out, you get jellyfish and slime and tinafores and stuff like that, stuff you can't eat. So these, this, these ecosystem effects, these spillovers, can have incredible changes on the state of the ecosystem. And one of the things that we've realized in looking at the various kinds of organisms that show up in the Cambrian is that many of them, in fact, are ecosystem engineers. Now, because we don't have abundance estimates, it's very difficult to, to figure out exactly what the impact of these organisms was. But it, it appears that they're also likely, along with predation, an important component of the ecological changes that we see at this time. So the system that I just described is one in which we have a long lag between the, the origin of the developmental tools that are required to build the, the um, complex animals that we see as biolaterians and the ecological or evolutionary expression of them as fossils. And this is not the only macroevolutionary lag that paleontologists have identified. Lags like this are common. This is not what Ernst Meyer told us about evolution. Ernst Meyer thought and wrote during the 1960s that evolution was very opportunistic. When new innovations came along, evolution would take advantage of them. That's not true. If we look, for example, at grasses, grasses are a good idea. Grasslands are widespread across North America, South America, um, Asia, many other parts of the world. It's hard to argue that grasses were not a wonderful evolutionary innovation. And it's easy to tell because they produce phytoliths what the history of grasses are. So if we look again with the molecular tree, um, this is one from Toby Kellogg in about 2001. Um, more recent ones are about the same. The origin of grasses is about 70 to 55 million years ago. It's more like about 55 million years ago. Um, interestingly enough, the last common ancestor of corn and rice um, is down here at about probably 45 million years ago. Um, but notice that there's already a diversification into major different groups of grasses by probably 55 or 45 million years ago. Kittle and Stromberg, who's now at the University of uh, Washington, has very carefully looked at the fossil record of grasses. And she finds a very different pattern. And this is the data right here is um, largely from North America, but the same thing happens in other parts of the world. Time is, is, in this case, going up here, so the presence somewhere up here. Grasses evolve somewhere down here at the bottom of the slide. There's a long lag, and then there's a diversification of some open um, habitat grasses. But grasses don't become ecologically dominant. Grasslands don't appear until 20 million years ago. That's a long lag between the origin and diversification of the group patenting the, the invention, if you will, and when they become important. Um, here's Joseph Schumpeter, who um, was mentioned yesterday afternoon. He also turns out to be one of my favorite economists. Uh, Schumpeter made a distinction between invention and innovation. Invention being the creation or the, the origin of something new. Um, this is, I think, just as true in, in technology as it is in biology, although Brian actually told me last week he doesn't like this distinction. He just didn't tell me why. Um, invention is when the innovations become economically or biologically significant. So for grasses, the invention is the diversify can be thought of as the diversification of the clade 45 million years ago. The innovation happens 20 million years ago when we finally see widespread grasslands, we see them in the fossil record. 
There's an interesting thing, uh, and this will be my last example before I get to the model. It turns out there's an interesting thing that anthropologists have picked up um, in the origin of early, um, early Homo sapiens, that the archaeological expression of symbolism, um, which we look at in terms of figurative uh, art, and as you'll, I'll show in a few moments, uh, even things like flutes, looks like, according to Chris Springer in his recent book um, on Lone, uh, Lone Survivor, it looks like that, symbol that ability to um, perform symbolic actions was essentially flickering over tens of thousands of years in Africa, probably from at least 75 or 80,000 years ago, until it really begins to take off in Africa and Europe sometimes after 45,000 years ago. And this makes the important point that some of these innovations actually take a while to get traction. And part of any general model of the process has to take into consideration what are the actual mechanisms, Stringer suggests that it's population growth, uh, a growth of multiple interacting populations that actually allows um, symbolism to really take off within our early ancestors. So if you go down to the Port Bay um, locality at the southern tip of South Africa. This is where a very well-known artifact in red ochre is shown here, as well as um, these, there are hundreds of thousands of these shell beads that have been constructed, as well as a lot of uh, very fine um, scrapers and, and points and other things. But this, both the, the shell beads and this these lines on this uh, piece of ochre from 75 to 80,000 years ago are taken as the first evidence of symbolism in Africa. Then it's, it's not until 32,000 years ago, for example, at the Chauvet Cave in France, that we get the real expression of the sort of symbolic art in the, the caves in, in southern France that uh, are really quite, quite incredible. So let, let me, in conclusion, sort of wrap this up into a model. And I'm going to take, although I'm not, I'm not entirely wild about the terms, I'm going to take them from a recent paper by Rich Lensky at Michigan State University, who has worked for a long time on uh, mutants within E. coli. Um, so how are these spaces created? And this is a very simple model. Um, needs a lot more work, but let me just suggest what may actually happen. The first step is what um, Rich calls potentiation. So you have to create the right environment, and that can be physical, it can be genetic or developmental, it can be ecological, to allow the, the uh, innovations and the inventions to occur in the first place. Because they can only really happen in these potentiated environments. They're then actualized by the actual mutants, um, in a case that uh, Rich was studying, or more generally by genetic and developmental inventions leading to a nuclease like grasses or some of the things that we saw in the, um, in the Cambrian. This is a very different model that comes out of the modern synthesis. This is a very famous figure from George Gale Simpson's book, Tempo and Mode and Evolution, published in 1944. Um, in this model, he has these adaptive zones shown in white. Um, time is going in this direction. These are successively more, com more uh, complicated adaptive zones. You can think about this as the origin of flight, for example, um, from some dinosaur wandering around um, trying to catch insects up to fully powered flight up here. But note that these adaptive zones continue off to the left ad infinitum. And the history of these ideas from the 1940s into the 1990s shows that people often viewed these adaptive zones as existing independent of the organisms um, that occupied them. In a technological sense, this is akin to thinking that the adaptive zone for the personal computer existed in the time of ancient Rome. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So this idea of potentiation that Rich has come up with makes the point that, you, that that's the beginning of creating this sort of space. Once the um, 
developmental and genetic changes have occurred, they're refined by further developmental um, and ecological changes. Um, and we see the same sort of thing in technology. And then they're realized as the invention passes to an innovation by ecological expansion and further evolutionary success. So those are the sort of steps that come out of looking at some of these events in the fossil record. And I'd like to suggest that there, um, that a similar sort of process, a similar sort of lags, may be happening in technological and cultural systems as well. And I'll close with the world's coolest animal. Thank you. Questions? Question time. Everybody's ready for lunch. Let's start with the author, Brian. Uh, Brian Arthur. <laughs> Brilliant as usual, <laughs> I should say yet again. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, you and I have been talking the last few days, and uh, just uh, to bring up a point that came up in our conversations, uh, there are an awful lot of technologies, and I'll mention two. Uh, one is radar, and the other is uh, penicillin, where the phenomenon behind the technology has been noticed very early on, just like with some of these, say, grasses, where the um, the p potential was lurking, you know, millions and millions of years before it was finally actualized. In the case of radar, the phenomenon that uh, high-frequency electromagnetic waves uh, would be reflected by some metal object, that was uh, known quite early on, before 1910. Uh, people were trying to send radio waves across the Potomac in Washington, D.C., and as ships came up the river, they noticed that uh, there was a distortion. And so that potential for radar was sitting there, but it was at least another 30 or so years before that was developed into full-fledged radar in Britain, in the US, Germany, and a number of other countries. Similarly with penicillin, the, the famous um, effect that certain spores uh, uh, of Penicillium notatum uh, could wipe out, um, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, the particular bacterium that it, it did in uh, uh, Steph uh, Stephanococcus? Yes, yeah. Uh, Stephanococcus. yeah. The, that particular uh, phenomenon had been noticed in 1875 and was noticed again in the 1880s. And there's a huge lag, and Fleming notices it in his lab in 1929 or thereabouts. But Fleming had been a doctor during the First World War and was very alerted to think of such things as possibly being able to cure gangrene. But it still floats when Fleming uh, notices it. Fleming didn't have the tools, uh, the adaptive tools or the innovation tools, to use Schumpeter's ideas, uh, to fully develop uh, penicillin, and it was another 13 or 14 years before a team, uh, Flory and Chine and others, were able to fully develop penicillin. So the bottom line here is that I think that virtually, or many of the phenomena or the, the lags that you've noticed in um, biology, in, in the biological record, apply very much uh, to technology. Mechanisms are slightly different, but it's the same sort of thing. Lots of technologies, if you trace them back, existed 20, 30, 100 years earlier, but they're not fully realized until there is a war or some major need, and then the scene shifts. Thanks. Oh, is it? Okay, this seems to be on. So I want to tie in what Brian just said with what John was talking about in his talk, which is uh, the coevolution, and there has to be some story about how the grasses initially started, and there was some soil bacteria that weren't quite right for that, and then it created a home where these particular bacteria could thrive, which then changed neighboring soil, which allowed the 
grass to thrive even better, et cetera, et cetera, and a co-evolutionary story between these different trees and how one's feeding off yeah. the other. Can you say more about co-evolution? Yeah, story? That, that's actually, so in the, this, the, this book that uh, Jim Valentine and I have just published on the Cameron Radiation, most of it's actually about that ecological dynamic because it looks to us like the primary cause for the Cameron Radiation is actually building out those ecological interactions. It's not development, it's probably not changes in the physical environment, although increased oxygenation was important as well. But it's, it's building those ecological interactions. Um, in the case of grasses, it actually um, may be at least in part an environmental change um, that allowed grasses to spread more broadly rather than that, that sort of coevolution. But it's exactly by trying to understand that those network of interactions, and particularly the kind of interactions um, like, um, as it turns out, bioturbation and the spread of oxygen in bottom waters that affect all members or many members of a community, the kind of things that, that Romer calls spillovers, um, or other economists have called spillovers, uh, that affect many components of an ecosystem that I think have the maximum impact on bootstrapping those interactions. But that's exactly the thing that I think is actually driving um, this sort of thing. And it's really, it's an issue of how you build and construct niches and interaction networks rather than just fill them up. Um, too much of the sort of 1980s view of ecology, or 1940s view even, was just filling an empty niche. Um, most of these niches are not constrained by physical parameters, they're constrained by biological parameters. So you actually have to figure out how you build that niche. Okay. So another one. So you did mention about um, the physical environmental change in, as your answer, but I would argue the physical environment change could contribute quite a lot. For example, the grassland. This is actually, if you look at the geological history, this is related to the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere change. So if you talk about Cambrian, uh, Cambrian exploration, this is also related. I mean, at that time, the Earth's uh, went back and forth between the ice house and hot house uh, quite a few times. Well, so, yeah, the, the end of the last glaciation was actually at 635. So the, the, the glaciations that I didn't talk about, that bracket these other events. But um, there's, there's no indication that the glaciations, either the Maranoan or the Sturdian, are actually connected to the biological events. There is an increase in oxygen there are a whole host of other geochemical changes, but the real problem for, um, there are two problems with, with uh, three problems, I'll keep counting, three problems I'll mention, with a purely geochemically driven explanation for the Cambrian. The first is that geochemistry doesn't help you get all those morphologies. It might help you with the timing, but not with the nature of the evolution. The second is that with oxygen, it's, it's clear that there's an increase in oxygen at some point in the late Neoproterozoic. The difficulty is that we can't tie down when that is happening. Um, and my view with, that we expand in this book is that most of the expansion of oxygen in shallow marine habitats is, it, is in fact a consequence of the biological activity. It's biologically mediated, not physically uh, mediated. That's a contentious hypothesis, but I think it's actually um, within the, the scope of the, the data that exists at this point. I also didn't have another half hour to go into all the, the geochemistry at that time. Yeah. That's very interesting. Uh, and and I, as I understood your model, it was uh, basically the environment changes. But I was wondering to what extent, and maybe the, the actual structure or the internal changes also. Because I, I, I took some things you said to say that, you know, you, you need to duplicate before you can perhaps, you know, duplicate Hox genes. There can't just be one. The potential can be there with one, but you may need duplicates, and could that take some of the time? To go back to John's model, you need to, to have a number of them a number of urns, maybe, or whatever model you want to think about before you can actually get the explosion. So is it... Well, but, but so the point that I was making about the genetic toolkit is that all of that gene duplication, not only in the Hox genes, but in many of the other transcription factors, 
has happened by 680 million years ago. So most of the tools, not all of them, there's some refinements that happen later, but most of the basic developmental tools are present long before the Cambrian explosion. So it doesn't look like it's um, the, the generation of new developmental tools. And then and, I'll make and, one, one other point, I, and, and I, accept, I understand better, but it could well be in a technological evolution that it is a need to get capability as well. Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, this uh, doesn't have to apply right. to everything, yeah. But, but, the, but the point is that what you want to do is understand the different components and how they interact. Yes, here yeah, the another one. Um, hello, hello. Okay, so I have um, three questions, and the first two are about the world's coolest animal, so forgive me the little trivial. So my first two questions are, what is that thing's name? And secondly, what exactly is the evolutionary purpose of five eyes? And my <laughs> third question is, um, when your, your model about potentiation and actualization, right? So there is a rather long lag time between potentiation and actualization, so... Can be, yeah. From what I understand of uh, evolution, right, put the potential doesn't contribute to the fitness. So is there the danger that that potential will be destroyed during that lag time? Pro yeah, to, to take your last question first, the, um, my guess, and, and that's actually one of the things that Rich Lensky saw in his um, experiments with E. coli, looking at the citrate mutant. So uh, they were looking at a, a mutant um, in which the E. coli could feed off of citrate, which is not a normal um, feeding source for E. coli, a uh, food source. And um, it turns out that many of the, poten the, the potentiation changes happened in other lineages, but those lineages died out before the actualization changes could happen. So in many cases, that you know, you'll get halfway there, and then you, the, the whole thing won't pan out. Um, this beast is, is called Opabinia, uh, O-P-A-B-I-N-A, Opabinia regalis. Um, and I have no idea why it has five eyes, but it obviously wasn't a great idea because it's only known through about three meters of rock on this one hillside in British Columbia. So it wasn't a great success, even if it is really cool. <laughs> and, oh, by the way, uh, since I'm a museum scientist, I have to say this. Um, we frequently, you know, we, you guys all know we have really dumb politicians in Washington um, <laughs> on both parties. Um, we pr periodically get these inane questions from the Hill about why we can't get rid of a lot of the fossils. We could just take pictures of them and save all the storage space and costs, um, and we could throw out all the, the stuff we don't need. Which, frankly, is how many of us feel about our politicians right now. Um, <laughs> but be that as it may, it turns out that you can't actually see all five eyes on, a, on any single specimen. You actually have to look at a bunch of, of specimens under different imaging things to finally convince yourself that there are actually all five eyes present there, which I've tried to explain to a couple of congressmen. It just <laughs> doesn't work. So, any more question? Oh, yeah, yes. Is there anything we can learn from the, the so-called failure cases, the evolutions that didn't make it, uh, like, for example, the world's coolest animal? Oh, sorry. Uh, um, no, I, I'm glad you think it's the world's coolest animal. That's good. Um, yeah, I, actually, this is a, is a really instructive case. Um, and let me go back to that slide that I skipped over. Um, this is an, an a, um, evolutionary tree of the lobopods, these things like Achaea, and the living Anacophrans, which is up, up here, Anacophra. There's Achaea, Lucidini would be in here. Opabinia is down here, um, Anilocris, and then eventually you get to the arthropods. Um, and tardigrades are, are, that's probably the wrong position for tardigrades, but this is a, um, an evolutionary tree showing the, the phylogenetic relationships between these different groups of animals. The only ones that were successful, incredibly successful, are these things down here. 
very successful. Tardigrades are in, in restricted habitat. The little water bears that you can get in toy shops, and you pour them water, and they. So they're really they're really good, and they've succeeded in toy shops. Um, <laughs> um, we, and anacophrons are not, are not noticeably successful. I, I, ha I have to stop telling stories, but this is a good story. Um, the, the, only the only known photographs of anacophrons giving birth, they give live birth, um, were taken in 1995 when the National Geographic was doing a story on the Cameron explosion. And they went down to Australia to take pictures of some living anacophrons. And it, um, Lou Mazzatena was setting this whole thing up and as he got this thing already and he's beginning to take pictures, it started giving birth, right? And the, the woman who actually studies these things had never actually seen them give birth before. So apparently, if you're the National Geographic, you can get photographs of that sort of thing. Um, but the, the point is that all of these things leading up to you arthropods are not terribly successful. But what they lack, all of these lack jointed appendages of the kind that we have in new arthropods. They also lack the kind of, as far as we can tell, the kind of innervation nerve systems in the anterior appendages that allows the differentiation of appendages within the, the anterior end of arthropods. You get some of that, certainly within animal acros, but nothing like the extent that you see in true arthropods. So it looks like, um, in contrast to what Steve Gould said in Wonderful Life, there actually is a really good reason why arthropods succeeded and not opabinia. And it had to do with the functional attributes of, the, of these different animals. Yeah, it's a one more question. Um, good afternoon. Um, you've given us a really fascinating look over the past 500 million years. I'm just wondering if you could, um, from the Smithsonian's point of view, look a little forward, um, very <laughs> considering the challenges that uh, Earth is facing. For example, we've got a 30% 30, a 30 rise in CO2, and um, uh, a lot of these world threats happening around. How does the Smithsonian see Homo sapiens, you know, the species, uh, progressing, say, in the next? I don't well, know. Um, first, let me say that I, I don't speak for the Smithsonian, particularly those comments about the congressman a few moments ago. <laughs> <laughs> Since they actually pay the bills sometimes. Um, so anything I will say will be my personal opinion and not the view of the it's the of the federal government. Um, yes, federal government. Um, so I spent a long time studying the end Permian mass extinction, which is the largest mass extinction in the last 600 million years. It was not the one that killed the dinosaurs. There was actually a more interesting extinction 250 million years ago that killed about 90% of everything in the ocean. Um, and the, the lesson that I take from that is that um, you don't want to get into a real mass extinction. There are a lot of people, in fact, I think we'll have a talk this afternoon or tomorrow about the Anthropocene, and, and Simon may also be discussing it in his talk. Um, there are many people who have argued that we're already in the midst of a mass extinction. Um, if that's true, uh, I would buy a good case of scotch, because <laughs> it isn't going to be fun. Um, I, I very much doubt whether you can actually do a lot if we're actually in a mass extinction. Um, my caveat, however, is that I don't think we're actually in a mass extinction of the, of the magnitude that we describe as paleontologists. And let me explain that, because this is a point that gets missed in a lot of the discussions about mass extinction. It's not that we haven't lost tremendous amounts of biodiversity. And it's not that we're not going to lose more biodiversity, both with habitat loss, with destruction of the environment, um, and with what's going to happen from global warming. What we see in the fossil record, the exception of opabinia and things like that aside, are widespread 
durably skeletonized and abundant taxa, mostly in the ocean. We don't see things on land. We don't see things that have small population size. We don't see things um, that are otherwise invisible to the fossil record. Widespread, durably skeletonized, and abundant, geographically widespread, also temporally widespread. Those aren't the things that have gone extinct, by and large. Things on islands have suffered tremendously, things in freshwater habitats, a lot of things on land. So we are not, if, you're, if you compare apples to apples, um, if you look at the same kind of data, most of the kinds of taxa that we would be able to pick up as paleontologists 10 million years in the future, say, are not the kinds of species that have disappeared yet. That means to me that although we've, we've already done a tremendous amount of damage to the planet, we're not yet at the threshold of a, of a mass extinction of the kind that, that I study as a paleontologist. It doesn't mean that what we've done is a good idea, and it doesn't mean that we won't get there eventually, because we will. Maybe not that, that too long a, a, a time, but once we've gotten there, I'm not sure there's a whole lot we can do about it. And frankly, my, my own suspicion is that, that, that part of that mass extinction will include humans. Um, and I take the fact that we're not yet in a mass extinction as a very cautionary note to make sure that we don't get into one. So. Okay. Do we have any other? Oh, yeah. On one of your early slides, uh, that two cases. Yeah. Oh well, there's the there's an ediac there's a initial event of this ediacaran biota, um, the soft bodied things. You go back to where. Yeah. This one. Yeah. So, can you explain the difference between the one that happened about 550 million and versus 520 million? Yeah. So what happens um, down here? is that we have the occurrence of this ediacaran biota. These are the soft-bodied things that have no mouths, no appendages, nothing. And they last from uh, the first one to actually date to 579 in Newfoundland, and they disappear at 542 in Namibia. And uh, we actually just had a paper out on whether or not there's a mass extinction of these things. But with the exception of Kimberella, none of them, and some sponges, none of them are, are these more complex animals. Then after 542, we see the rapid appearance of many different kinds of animals. Many of these things that we see up here in stage three probably evolved down here in stage two and maybe even in stage one, but they, um, these body plans for various reasons are unlikely to have evolved further down than that. So we really do have, it turns out to be three phases is what, what we see. This first Ediacaran biota here, the small shelly fauna um, of these plates and tubes and things in the Fortunian in stage two, and then all these other bioterians in, in stages three and four. And do you think, this is obviously a schematic, but do you think that um, it was as quick as this suggests in the diffusion? as to say within a few the, million years? The, this, is as, this is based on the cumulative accumulation based on first occurrences of phylum classes. So it's actual fossil data. Um, and this, this is what you see in the fossil record. And it matches very closely with what you get from the trace fossil record or burrows and tracks and things like that. So the origin of these things can be off by a couple of million years but it's not going to be off by more than that. And you know, this is an argument that we've been having since I was in graduate school. And um, through my career, the, the rapidity of this um, explosion has, uh, has simply solidified yeah. and, and has actually gotten shorter. Do you think that happens in other forms of innovation? Um, it turns, so 
the best counterexample of this um, are, are actually trees and plants, vascular plants. They don't do this. They, they do this in one way, it, trees do this in that you get all the different architectures of making a tree in the Devonian about 380 million years ago, and then the number of different kinds of trees sort of winnows away. But, but other aspects of um, plant structure are much more successive than uh, happens with the Cambrian. So it doesn't have to be like this. It just happens that this one is like this. You, you do see this pattern also after uh, major mass extinctions. So there's a, a great paper by Ann Yoder, I think it was Ann Yoder, and about the placental mammals in science about two, or nature, one of those two, um, about two or three weeks ago that showed that mammals did the same thing after the uh, end of the dinosaurs. We see the same thing actually after the end of the Permian um, where ichthyosaurs plesiosaurs, turtles, mammals, dinosaurs, all explode within five or seven million years after the end of the extinction. Turtles are actually the second coolest thing next to Opavinia, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> oh, Kevin? Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, good afternoon. Just now I, I got this uh, impression from your answer that you were saying, like, uh, you probably think that this uh, massive extinction uh, anyway happened, no matter what we do. Uh, is this impression correct? No, I think we still have a we still have some hope. Um, no. There are many people who have claimed that we're already in what's called the sixth great mass extinction. Uh, no, my question is like even without human being, you think this uh, massive extinction will happen? They uh, well, in its own way or like well. It, it may not be, it's just uh, something by chance, all the different factors. So. Um, if humans had not evolved, there would be another mass extinction sometime. Massive volcanic eruptions would happen, another bolide would fall out of the sky. Um, it, it's unlikely it would be happening right now. What's happening now is because of people. Okay, so then uh, what you are thinking is like this uh, massive extinction is mainly because of some external force like uh, something bump into the earth or something like that. The, the, the system itself uh, may not really have this kind of uh, massive uh, extinction by itself, like it, uh, you know, just a collapse right. without, so, without so anything bump into the earth or something. So like that. that's a really good question about whether or not mass extinctions can be endogenously driven. Stuart Kaufman is, has argued for years that some of the extinctions can be um, caused by basically the internal collapse of ecosystems um, that, that produce a, a runaway negative feedback. Um, there's actually no evidence of that. Um, so all of, the ma all of the, well, four of the five classic mass extinctions that are, are best studied all have evidence of external drivers. Um, and the two biggest extinctions, the one at the end of the Permian, which is due to the Siberian eruption of massive volcanism in Siberia that basically covers all of Siberia. Um, and then the KT impact are very significant external drivers. So it's certainly possible, but we actually don't have any evidence that, that that's the case. What was the one that uh, doesn't have an external, excuse me, uh, you said four out of the five. And the last one that didn't have an external factor? Well. Um, is the Devonian, and we don't really understand what's going, whether there's even a mass extinction in the Devonian. There are a series of biotic crises um, through the late Devonian. Um, whether they actually amount to a mass extinction is something that a lot of people have disputed. Um, and so it's, um, there are certainly a series of uh, ocean, changes in ocean chemistry during that time that could be driving the patterns that we see, particularly in Europe. Um, and to some extent, North America. But whether that even really constitutes a mass extinction is unclear. That's, so that's why I left it out. OK. Before we close this session, let me pass a, a small gift as appreciation oh. to Thank the fantastic you. talk. <laughs>